<clears throat> so today we're going to talk about uh, biological oxygen demand. We've finished uh, the wastewater microbiology and wastewater, basically wastewater activated sludge. Um, we will come back briefly after Thanksgiving to um, wastewater in terms of what we do with the residuals, the solids that we have left over, and a couple more thoughts about specific options to eliminate other nutrients further. But these, uh, those two topics I'm not going to test you on quantitatively on the exam. Um, so what I'm, or, you know, or give you directly on the homework. So my, my goal this week is to get you up to speed with the last, um, last topics that we're going to quantitatively deal with uh, for the exam and for the homework, and then um, give you a, one lecture on the, the biosolids type stuff and one lecture kind of exam review um, after Thanksgiving. So I will have your exams, exam two, back to you on Thursday. So I'll have those in class for those of you who want to come get them. And then um, I have finished grading your homework threes. I haven't posted the solution, or I haven't posted the grades for those yet. I'll go ahead and do that when I update the exam two grades in Moodle. Um, so I'll, I'll mention a, a thing or two more about that on Thursday. So today I want to get as far as we can through this BOD section, talk about um, more specifically what is BOD, how do we measure it, how do we model it downstream. And the slides I have posted for today are too long for me to get through just today. So I will um, plan on picking back up and wrapping up on Thursday, um, probably after we talk about the uh, exam too. Okay, so with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, one thing I did wanna draw your attention to is that I've posted another quiz um, to Moodle. This is on secondary treatment. It'll be due before you are tuning out for Thanksgiving, essentially. So by midnight on the 24th is the due date I set. Um, so definitely take Take a look, take that. It's a five minute quiz. Um, I should uh, rename it because that was, it's no longer April. <laughs> but so go ahead and do this quiz. Um, we'll probably post one or two more uh, before the end of the semester. So just wanted to let you know that that's, that's here. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started on lecturing. Uh, as always, if you do have questions, let me know. Okay, so we mentioned BOD a few times already. Uh, we discussed how this is essentially the food that microbes eat, and it's really a quantification of the amount of oxygen they are consuming while they eat that food. And so that's, uh, while we're measuring oxygen, it's, a, it's directly related to how much food the microbes have available to them. And so that's a direct correlation to how much they're converting oxygen plus that food stuff into CO2 and cells. <clears throat> the more food we give, the more oxygen they'll demand in that regard. So there's a few ways to, to think about oxygen demand more generally. So we have this BOD, the biochemical or biological oxygen demand. So that's what we've talked about. We could also take a step back and say, well, we, we have a theoretical amount of oxygen that could be demanded based on chemical reactions. We would call this our theoretical oxygen demand. We actually looked at some problems like this at the beginning of the semester, refreshing ourselves with chemistry. So this would be the maximum possible oxygen demand if we were to have complete oxidation of our system. So in this case, we might say, well, glucose, sugar, is going to be oxidized, and we could calculate, so C6H12O6, we're gonna add oxygen here, some amount of oxygen, and then that would yield us some amount of CO2 and some amount of water. So we could calculate the, the theoretical 
maximum amount of oxygen required on a molecular basis or mole per mole basis, how much oxygen is that some amount of glucose going to demand? So this is theoretical because it doesn't always work out that perfectly and we rarely have <clears throat> just glucose, for example. So the, in biology, there's very likely going to be some inefficiencies in terms of not every single carbon here is going to be converted to CO2. Um, and so the actual oxygen demand will be less than the theoretical, but if we were to put this in a combustion chamber, give it the perfect um, opportunity and conditions, we, we may be able to measure pretty much experimentally a match to that theoretical. Okay, so that's a second tool we could use. And as we're thinking about oxygen demand, the, the point here is to understand what happens to uh, oxygen in rivers and streams and lakes when we discharge wastewater into it. Because if this is one of those conventional primary issues that we're trying to deal with, with wastewater, we don't want the fish to be starved of oxygen. We don't want that um, when a pond or some body of water goes anoxic, it starts producing compounds that stink really badly. So there's all sorts of reasons we don't want that. And understanding that, the biochemical one is what we'll see is usually the most useful. We use it a lot in wastewater. It's not typical and it's not convenient to use theoretical for most cases because there's some mixture of all sorts of different compounds. We would have to know information about exactly how many of them there are and what exactly is their molecular composition. It becomes an impossible task when we have a mixture of so many different sources of organic molecules. So it's this is a good for calculating problems and maybe if we have one very specific waste stream source, but it's not so good if we've got um, our typical uh, wastewaters that are that contain quite a lot of different compounds. Okay, another type of oxygen demand that we can uh, measure, I say type, it's another way of estimation, uh, way of estimating the amount of oxygen that will be demanded. This would be chemical oxygen demand. So we categorize this one or classify it based on um, a chemical reaction that we treat to, to really find exactly how much oxygen is demanded when we get some specific oxidizing, oxidizing conditions. So we expose, let's say, the sugar to a combustion chamber, blast it with some uh, reactive chemicals, and high temperature, maybe sometimes even ultraviolet light, and measure how much oxygen was demanded during that combustion. Now, something as simple as glucose, maybe we get very near perfect combustion, and then our COD is close to our theoretical. Um, again, in practice, when we've got some mixture, some molecules are just not going to be very combustible. If you think about um, our Nonstick cookware. We, we coat nonstick cookware with these polymers. Uh, they're essentially PTFE, so they're uh, perfluorinated um, polymers, and they've got these fluoride atoms, and it's very hard to dislodge those. It's very hard to oxidize the carbon fluoride. Uh, you know, we, we normally oxidize our carbon hydrogen very easily, but this one's very difficult. So if we put some molecules like that, Theoretically, we could oxidize it, but the conditions we're providing, maybe they can't. So some molecules are going to be variable in how easy this happens. Um, and in this case, you know, we're literally burning or oxidizing this to CO2, water, and typically with some organic molecules, we'll probably have nitrogen and some other stuff. <clears throat> okay, so put together, we say the theoretical is the highest amount possible that this solution or this chemical in solution is going to demand. The next would be the chemical. So chemical oxygen demand, that measurement, usually gets more, it oxidizes more stuff than biology can do. So if we're looking at our measurements, we have this theoretical as the top. That's going to be an overestimate of what actually happens. Then a chemical oxygen demand, another overestimate uh, but closer to what we may, we would actually expect. And then finally, the BOD 
which is going to be a direct measurement. We take a jar and actually let bacteria do their thing for five days typically, and then we call it BOD5, and actually measure the action of the biology. So we're gonna get into that in more depth. A um, Couple things to consider here. When we're doing the biological oxygen demand, one reason it's not, uh, not such a perfect oxidation here is because we end up forming some stable byproducts. When we're processing, and we'll, we'll see a, a little graphic of the nitrogen cycle in a minute. When we're processing these different organic chemicals, a lot of times we will end up with nitrates, nitrites, phosphate, and we see these oxygen in here. So sometimes we'll, we'll be oxidizing and using some oxygen for this, but we'll be oxidizing different parts and then these will be emitted um, and it's not all just cells and CO2. So there's different chemistry going on, different things happening, um, but essentially these are kind of the, the big picture reactions that we would have going on in these two cases. Okay, so there's a couple subsets we can talk about for BOD itself. If we want to understand how the oxygen is being demanded, we typically think of BOD as how much oxygen is demanded by the carbon species, so the carbonaceous BOD. This would be some molecule attached to a carbon. That's this R, it doesn't matter what it is, it's just some, the rest of the molecule has stuff and then there's carbon. Well, that carbon is what we're considering forming the CO2. So that's the, the carbonaceous. That's like our sugar example. We've got part of its carbon, that amount is gonna be oxidized and you get that picture. There's also nitrogenous. So the amount of nitrogen inside a compound, um, it's gonna be in some form that's like ammonia or in, you know, in some, and maybe it's also part of a bigger compound, but there's that ammonia group in there, a nitrogen group. Then that can react with oxygen and form nitrate and nitrite. So that process will require some oxygen and these are not, you know, this isn't a balanced equation or anything here, um, as you see. So it's worth kind of taking a look at the nitrogen cycle. When we have plant-based nitrogen, that's gonna be some organic form. It's gonna be kind of like some other carbons, maybe oxygens, hydrogens, whatever else, and then connected to a, to a nitrogen group. Maybe it's NH2, maybe it's NH3, whatever it is. It's going to be in some form. Our DNA has a bunch of nitrogen in it, for example. So when that de decomposes, or is maybe consumed by something else, which then decomposes or excretes waste, that's usually going to be in some form that's ammonium or ammonia. And likewise, when we uh, excrete urea, that a lot of urea is ammonia. So that then um, is going to be processed by bacteria, which are going to use oxygen from the atmosphere, that oxygen demand, and convert it to nitrite. They can go further, can convert it to nitrate. Um, some of them can end up doing what's called denitrification. They're releasing oxygen and forming N2. Um, that's a very small subset of organisms that can do that, so that's not as typical. Sometimes we'll design a system to intend to grow those um, as a final step of nitrogen removal, but that's not typically something that's gonna affect our BOD measurement because it's a little more specialized. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the important processes here. Of course, this nitrate can also be taken right back up by plants um, and used and the cycle can continue. There's ways organisms can take nitrogen from the atmosphere, so they're nitrogen fixing, and convert it to some useful amount or useful form. Um, actually, most of the useful nitrogen we get naturally, because N2 is not useful, it's just kind of sitting there, pretty inert. Most of the usable nitrogen in, uh, in natural systems is actually coming from lightning strikes. The, the amount of uh, energy in the, in the lightning, we got all that N2, there's also lots of oxygen, They'll, you'll end up forming quite a bit of nitrates and possibly nitrites. 
from uh, lightning strikes, which is pretty interesting. We have a similar process that we use to create fer fertilizer. It requires a lot of energy, just as lightning strikes do. Okay, so how do we measure this BOD then? Again, I'm going to start introducing now this BOD5. You've probably seen this in some of our word problems, and I never mentioned it, so you probably were just thinking, okay, what's that? I don't know. This 5 is indicating 5 days. So a 5-day BOD test. We could do it 10 days. We could do it 3 days. We could change this, but 5 days is a good amount of time uh, in practice because that'll give the bacteria plenty of time to get to a, the point where they are growing, they are consuming, and they're, the amount that they've consumed is kind of leveled off. They're not consuming lots more. And so if we standardize everything by that five days, we can get a good picture of uh, something like 90, 95% of the oxygen that they are going to consume or could consume it. You know, if you gave them an infinite amount of time, it'll be reasonably close to that. And it's also a good picture of what happens downstream if you do discharge waste. Um, you're not expecting to have a lot more demand than that. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, we're going to take a sealed bottle, and I've got a couple pictures from online here uh, that are typical BOD um, bottles. So the common practice is to use something about, about this size. Um, these are 300 milliliters, and that's just kind of the typical, typical size. We could do different, but pretty much all the problems I'll give you, that'll be the, the total volume that we, we would work with. We don't want any light to enter the bottle because we don't want photosynthesis happening. It's kind of the inverse of uh, respiration. We're measuring respiration here, how much oxygen is being demanded. If you have photosynthesis going with some algae, then you're producing oxygen and it's going to make our results a little awkward because we don't understand exactly what's going on. So that's why we would have them in amber vials or maybe coating a clear, clear bottle with uh, aluminum foil or something, uh, putting it in the dark, something to make sure that we're not we're not doing photosynthesis. <clears throat> then we're just going to allow them to let whatever bacteria, whatever biological processes are happening, to do that for five days, and we're going to measure the oxygen before and after, and maybe even during. So these guys have oxygen sensors that are inside here. They are keeping, the, these lids are also going to keep the solution um, or keep it uh, airtight so that we don't have exchange between the air and water inside here and the atmosphere. We don't want that. And so essentially, we're, since we're measuring before and after, we get a picture of how much we started with versus how much we finished with. So there's some important um, parameters here, important um, caveats that we're going to get into with our calculations. Um, water can only hold so much oxygen. So O2 saturation for water is typically around 8 to 10 milligrams per liter. Depends a lot on the temperature. And that's milligrams of oxygen per liter. So if we had a high strength wastewater and it's going to demand more than a few milligrams per liter of oxygen, then we're going to deplete all the oxygen and we won't know how much we could have depleted if it had more oxygen, right? So we end up having to dilute the solution to make the, to make it the wastewater weaker so that we can actually have a measurable amount remaining so that we know exactly how much was, um, was removed per per amount of wastewater we had in there. Um, again, because if we, if we remove everything and then it could have removed more, but we didn't give it that opportunity, we have no idea how much it would have removed. Okay, so that dilution then, this is going to uh, be important because we, we have a limited amount of starting, starting oxygen that we can work with in the water. Okay, so for the calculations, what we do is we allow the uh, solution to sit there for five days, measuring before and after, and the simple test, if 
you know, there's no, no other complicating factors, we would just have the measurement to begin with, the initial dissolved oxygen. So DO, by the way, this is going to be dissolved oxygen in molecular form, so dissolved O2. So the DO initial, that's just our first measurement. Then we're going to subtract our final measurement, and that's going to give the amount demanded. P here is if we have to complicate it by diluting the, the wastewater. You know, if we just took a sample from a pond that looked kind of like it had a lot of sediment and stuff in it that looked, looked like there's probably some oxygen demanding stuff in it, um, but not, not like straight up wastewater, maybe we don't even need that P and it's just going to be one. We don't dilute it, so we just leave that alone. And then it's just how much we started with minus how much we ended with. Simple as that. Okay, so that would be the very simplest form. It's essentially a measurement. BOD then is a measurement literally of the concentration of oxygen removed during the five days. So the dilution factor then, if we need that, this is going to be the volume of wastewater divided by the total volume in the, the beaker or in the um, flask. And I'll, I'll draw this again in a moment, but essentially we're going to add some amount of wastewater and then the rest of it will be um, just dilution water. <coughs> so this would then be VD and that lower part would be the volume of wastewater. So if we have to dilute it, maybe it's going to look like that. And as you see, the total volume is just going to be that those two added together. OK, so that dilution factor, that P then, is the fraction of this entire system that is wastewater. It's all it is, the, just that fraction. Okay, So if a quarter of it was wastewater, then our dilution factor is going to be 1 over 4, which is 0.25. So this is, this is typical to dilute it. Um, so, and this is obviously P is going to be less than or equal to one and it's gonna be greater than zero. Okay, so yeah, question? Okay, so good question. For the dissolved O2, are we ever counting free radicals? Um, no, we, we won't count radicals here because they, they typically won't last long enough in solution. Um, there are a number of radicals that uh, we could consider. Um, so something like OH radicals or superoxide radical anions. Those really just don't last very long. Um, if they are generated by some process, then they're going to be consumed, reacted with each other, reacted with something on the order of nanoseconds, uh, sometimes even less. So that is a component that can oxidize stuff and it oxidizes things very well. But unless we've got some, uh, some interesting reaction happening like hydrogen peroxide with iron that can form hydroxyl radicals um, or sunlight or some other source of light creating photocatalyzed radicals, we typically won't have enough for it to make a difference. Um, if we have hydrogen peroxide, we would certainly that would certainly act as a oxygen source. So we that and it would also be um, reacting with some of the organic. So um, hydrogen peroxide, we don't expect it to be in the solution, but if it was, we would probably have to account for that. It's a good question. Okay, so I've got a, a quick practice problem here. So this is. Example 5.1 on page 200, we have 10 milliliter sample of sewage mixed with enough water to fill a 300 milliliter bottle. So again, that's the total volume there. Has an initial dissolved oxygen value of 9.0 milligrams per liter 
Uh, and the problem says to help assure an accurate test, it is desirable to have at least two milligrams per liter drop in DO during the five day run. And the DO final should be at least two milligrams per liter remaining at the end of the experiment. Uh, for what range of BOD5 would this dilution produce the desired results? So take a moment, think about how you would approach this. Uh, what it's talking about it, with the BOD5 range, that's what range of concentrations could this setup handle um, and be within that margin where we didn't remove too much oxygen to the point where we're not sure if maybe it could have removed more and we removed enough so that it wasn't just we're not sure exactly because our, our little sensor is not we don't count on every sensor to be like really high grade super um, well calibrated and precise sensors these tests are going on all over the place basically every wastewater treatment plant and so we've got relatively cheap sensors they're not super precise or whatever so we need some some range of buffer right we don't want to count on 0 0.001 change in oxygen and rely on that we we want to go ahead and make sure there's at least two milligrams per liter of a drop uh, and at least two milligrams per liter remaining uh, because we're we don't trust our sensors quite enough so what strength of wastewater we could write that S is less than or equal to and greater than or equal to what numbers? Okay, so the high end and the low, low end. Give that a moment. Think about how you would approach that. And then I'll work, it, work, work through it with you. And remember, the uh, we're defining our BOD here as DOI minus DO final divided by that dilution factor. Should it be 3 over 310 for the P? Three, three over three, three, no, so the, that's a good question. So 
the question is, should it be 10 over 310 for P? Um, no, the reason is because the problem says to fill a 300 milliliter bottle. So what that's showing us is that the total bottle can handle 300 milliliters. And so this will pretty much hold true every time we do this, so just keep this in mind, that rather than do 3 over 310, that means that we've got 10 milliliters out of 10 plus 290. So we had to subtract 10 milliliters from our dilution. Um, so we have, essentially we're adding um, pure water, 290 milliliters of pure water, and 10 milliliters of the wastewater. Okay, so hopefully you've had a moment to, to consider this. For the, the minimum amount of BOD in there, so let's think about this. BOD5 is greater than or equal to, that means we're talking about at minimum we have X amount of waste. So that minimum was at least a two milligram per liter drop here. So that means our drop, which is the initial minus the final, if the minimum value there is given to us as two milligrams per liter, that means right here is gonna be 2.0 milligrams per liter. So at minimum, we had that much drop. That means if we do this calculation, then our minimum amount of BOD5 that we can use here is you know, two divided by this uh, one over 30 or 10 over 300. And this is gonna be uh, 60 milligrams per liter, milligrams BOD per liter. And this is the minimum. Okay. On the other hand, if we want at least two milligrams per liter remaining, we and we started with nine, that would be my nine minus two, uh, again, milligrams per liter O2. So this is gonna be seven, uh, a drop of seven. We can't do more than a drop of seven, so this is the um, the BOD5 must be less than or equal to this maximum value here. And we do this calculation, seven divided by 10 over 300. This is gonna give us 210 milligrams BOD per liter. Okay. So not too complicated, but kind of an awkward, awkward system of understanding what's happening. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so the question here is about this, uh, this last part here, the final DO should be at least two milligrams per liter, right? And, and you're asking, does that go with the one above it? Yeah, like, how you, could you like underline on me if it is that we had at least a two milligram drop, like that's how you got that first one. Mm -hmm. So like the second part of it. Okay, um, okay, yeah, let me, let me explain that a little better. So for the first part, we defined the drop. We had at least two milligrams drop. And so I just went ahead and wrote it here, right, as two milligrams. Um, I could have written that as the DO initial we know is nine, 9.0, minus whatever it takes to get to at least two down from that, a total of two down. So if I said 8.5 here, that's not enough enough of a drop. That's only 0.5 milligrams per liter. We only dropped a little bit. So I, I would actually have to write seven in here because nine minus seven is two. So we we know that the, um, the final dissolved oxygen concentration here is seven milligrams per liter. So remember this DOF, that's the dissolved oxygen that's remaining at the end of the experiment. So if it only drops this amount, that's the minimum we're comfortable with measuring, right? Then on the, on the flip side, 
we're not comfortable measuring below two milligrams per liter because we're not sure of our sensor. Maybe if it's actually one, we might get an error or it, it looks like it's 1.5 because the instrument's not, um, not good enough or you know, we're just worried about some other processes starting to take place. So we want to make sure that the, we never go below a DO of um, two milligrams per liter remaining at the end of the experiment. So that's how we defined these two um, in terms of should have at least two milligrams per liter um, that, that final DO. So that when you see that final DO, that's, that's referring to DOF here. And the drop, um, this drop was referring to DOI minus DOF. So we have to complicate things a little bit more. Um, again, it's going to stay relatively straightforward. These are just going to be algebra problems. But keeping the different pieces in mind and understanding where they go, that's going to be this uh, bit of a complicated part. So the next concept here is if we dilute our wastewater by a lot, we take lots of pure water and just add a little bit of really high strength wastewater. We end, we end up having a problem where we probably no longer have enough bacteria to do the biological degradation process that we, we need to have going on. So if we dilute it too much, we don't have bacteria. If we don't have bacteria, then we're not going to have much oxygen removal, and it's going to take a few days before they grow up enough so that we have some oxygen removal. That's going to kind of create a problem when we wanted to do this test for five days and understand what's going on in five days. Okay, so that it kind of goes back to our wastewater microbiology that we learned about. If we, if our X value is too low, they can't consume enough substrate um, like we want them to. So, if this is the case, if we have high dilution, we need to add bacteria. When we do this, in order to keep bacteria happy, they tend we tend to give them some food to just stay with. So. It's like adding yeast to our bread or something, or maintaining a yeast culture. You can imagine you're giving them some nutrients there to, even though you really just care about the yeast, which are, you know, it's not bacteria, but it's a, a microbe. You're allowing them to be living there so they have some amount of food just sitting there. So we're gonna end up adding a little bit of substrate to our solution, which will complicate things because we're then adding some oxygen demanding substance when we're trying to measure just the wastewater where it's, it's going to complicate things a little bit but our equations will take care of it for us we just need to know the different pieces the different parts and how to understand uh, the problems okay so we're adding this to this bacteria this means we're adding some bod when we do that we're going to have some amount of wastewater so the volume of the wastewater, and this is, um, this stuff will have high BOD. And then the rest of the water is going to be our dilution water up to basically where we fill it. And this is going to be our volume dilution. This will be um, a small amount of BOD in here. So combining those, we're going to have a net BOD that's acceptable, that we can measure and work with, uh, but we just need to keep in mind that we've, when we do these uh, experiments, we're going to have to know how much BOD is in that dilution. Um, so it turns out we have to do, if we have to do this dilution and seed, the, seed that bacteria, and it, you'll notice the problem before mentioned, um, Let's see, it said simple uh, sample of, oh, here it is, unseated five-day BOD test. So in the, in the problem title, it said unseated uh, because it, we hadn't learned about it yet. So we're, that example was unseated. That means we didn't add any bacteria. We didn't need to. Um, so we didn't have that complication. 
If we do want to seed that bacteria into the solution, then it becomes a little more complicated and our total BOD in the mixture, this is just going to be a dilution uh, problem. We've done these very simple mass balances since the beginning of the class. This is a concentration times a volume. So that's going to give us a total mass equals the concentration times the volume in one part plus the concentration times the volume in the other part, right? So very simple mass balance here. So this is that concentration times volume of the mixture is going to be equal to the concentration of the wastewater times the volume of the wastewater plus the concentration of the dilution times the volume of dilution. Okay, we want to keep in mind our dilution factor does not change. So that's, we're keeping that the same. <clears throat> so M here, by the way, this is for mixture. And the D over here, that's the dilution. That wasn't already clear. So we have one other equation that we need to know here, and that is dealing with, um, well, basically a derivative of this dilution coefficient, uh, dilution factor. One minus the dilution factor is going to give us VD over VM. So if we think about the portion of this volume that is wastewater, that's our dilution factor, well one minus that should be the portion of the mixture that is dilution, right? So if we just have the dilution in the wastewater, then one minus the portion that is one is equal to the portion of the other. So we could write this as VD over VW plus V D, right? We just subbed in V mixture here. We could also write this one as V wastewater divided by the volume of the mixture. Okay, so just some rearrangements here, a couple things to consider. We're going to use this, this little um, exchange here as a simplification for our problem in a moment, for our uh, equation because we're going to derive an equation that essentially gives us the BOD and the wastewater given the measurements. In the previous slide in that problem we were looking at BOD of the wastewater given some measurements. We want to do that again but with the complication that we have a couple different measurements to make now. Okay so to find that BOD of the wastewater right now we have this equation this mass balance but what we're going to need is a way to convert from that to the simple measurements of uh, how much oxygen was demanded in our experiment. All right, so what we're going to do is re start rearranging here. We want BOD of the wastewater. We can divide everything by the volume of the wastewater. That's going to give us, um, so that'll get rid of this part. That'll give us VD over V wastewater and Vm over wastewater. So when we do that, and then we can multiply both sides by this, or I guess divide both sides by this guy, we will end up with this, this line down here. So we end up with the BOD of the wastewater equals BOD of the mixture times Vm over Vw minus BOD of the dilution times this VD over V wastewater. Okay, we can simplify that. Here is 1 over P. We can see that because it's that volume of the mixture divided by the volume of wastewater. That's literally the inverse of P. And over here we have, uh, we can actually factor this out a little bit and convert that to 1 over P, excuse me, 1 minus P divided by P. Um, so you could work out the uh, the math there if you'd like. Um, you could also, um, con yeah, so don't worry about the details here. You don't have to do this part on your own. I'm just showing you. This is where we're getting it from. We could expand this and, and uh, simplify it until we get it in terms of P, and this is what it looks like. 
Okay, so that just makes it easier to deal with a system instead of handling the volume of dilution, volume of wastewater all the time. Just having NP gives us that one parameter that we can we can put in there. So then we're essentially left with, because uh, we can factor out the one over P here, we're essentially left with this equation and this is on your formula sheet for the BOD of the wastewater given BOD of the mixture minus BOD the dilution times 1 minus P, all that divided by P. Okay, so that's where it's coming from. Now, this means we do need to make sure we, our measurements, our primary measurements are going to be the beauty of that mixture, but we also need some measurements for the dilution water. Maybe we know this and chances are anybody that's, that are doing these experiments routinely, they probably have a bunch of these occurring, you know, every day, several every week. And they probably have a good idea of what the BOD of the dilution water is, but maybe if they change the recipe a little bit um, in preparing this, the um, bacteria solution, maybe it's going to change a little bit. So you, they actually do need to measure it um, at the same time. So every time you do these BOD, the seeded BOD tests, you actually have one that is just the dilution. And we just have, we, we have that experiment where we're just measuring what's happening in our bottle um, for the dilution water. And then this other one where we have the V mixture. And we're making measurements on that one. Okay, so that would end up giving us our BOD of the wastewater then uh, based on the equation we just looked at, is going to be equal to DOI. So this is for the mixture here. Uh, let me match the colors. So we have the DOI minus DO final for the mixture. And then we have these other terms where we have, oh, excuse me, I did that wrong. This is the mixture in green. And then in the dilution only, which we're introducing a couple of new terms here, this part is the measurements in the, di in the uh, dilution only. So BI is going to be initial DO, so dissolved oxygen, in volume dilution, or I guess in the, um, in the dilution experiment. So it's really just another dissolved oxygen term, um, and B final is the same thing. In this bottle. Okay, so it's just a new term there, uh, B instead of DO, just to avoid confusion with DOs there. Okay, so that's the way we can. Uh, identify and measure, bless you, and we'll have these, uh, this one on your equation sheet as well, I think. Maybe I'll double check that with you in a minute. Um, but essentially, if you have this equation, you should be able to know and recognize that that comes straight to here because when we measure, when we make a measurement for the beauty of the mixture, that's the whole point is measuring that mixture that's going to be the dissolved oxygen initial minus final. The BOD of the dilution, it's the same thing except in the other bottle, in the dilution only bottle. So, and I probably should have drawn these um, the other way around for less confusion. But here we go. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so another practice problem here, 
This one's example 5.2 in page 202. Here we have a test bottle that, uh, containing just seeded dilution water, and it has its DO level drop by one milligram per liter in a five-day test. A 300 milligram BOD bottle filled with 15 milliliters of wastewater, and the rest, um, the rest is seeded dilution water, um, sometimes expressed as a dilution of one to 20, experiences a drop of 7.2 milligrams per liter in the same period, so in five days. What would be the five-day BOD of the waste? So I'll go ahead and write a couple things here. So BOD, the waste, wastewater is what we're asking. And remember that BOD of the wastewater, that's going to be our BOD of the mixture plus BOD of the dilution times one minus P. It's probably minus. One second. I was thinking about that myself. Yes, it's a minus. It felt wrong as I wrote it, but not wrong enough, apparently. <laughs> okay, so that was our equation. Thank you for uh, double checking that. And we're given some information about both the dilution test and the the test with the mixture here. So go ahead and take a minute and uh, work on that. 
Okay, so it probably should look like this as you're solving. We have beauty of the wastewater. We can calculate the P. Should be 0.05, 1 divided by 20 is 0.05. So in our mixture, we had a drop of 7.2 milligrams per liter. So it doesn't give us any information about the starting point of the oxygen, but it did give us the amount that it dropped. So even without knowing what we started with, we should be able to know how much it dropped if, because it gave, it gave that to us. So we don't need the DO initial per se. We can just say it's 7.2 is the total drop here. And then in the dilution water, that was a drop of one milligram per liter BOD. And we multiply that by, excuse me, that should have been uh, one minus 0.5, so that should be 0.95. And all that divided by 0.05. I don't have this calculated out in front of me. So if any of you would like to Sorry, one moment. I'm actually moving the screen capture screen. I got 125. 125? Okay. So we'll go ahead and write 125 and, and double check that that makes sense. Okay, so 125 milligrams per liter is the estimate here for the amount of BOD in the wastewater. In terms of what we know about wastewater, that would be kind of on the weaker side, but certainly within normal ranges. So that sounds good. Um, you know, seven minus, essentially that's about, it's almost seven minus one, right? So let's just do the calculator real quick here. Because it should just be seven minus 0.95, right? Is one times 0.95. So that divided by 0 0.05 should very simply. Okay, so one of us did something wrong, or maybe I misheard you. you did you say? Why 7.2. 7.2. Yeah, that that would be the problem. Yeah. So that that changes things. 7.2 minus 0.95 divided by 0.05. Right. There we go. Perfect. Okay, great. All right, so any questions there? All right, so like I said, this is complicated in, in that it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of different moving parts. You have to be able to understand and interpret the, the text here, what it means by a drop and fact that you don't have to have the initial value some things like that but overall it's not not a very difficult equation to use um, so that's kind of about it for um, our observations of BOD and how to measure them Oops. all right so from there we want to know how that's going to impact downstream. If we discharge into a river, what happens, you know, a couple miles down river, or, you know, how long is it going to take before we no longer have an effect of wastewater that we added? Okay, so that's going to bring us to this modeling component where we're looking at essentially the dissolved oxygen uh, deficit, or what we could call the dissolved oxygen sag curve. So if we think about dissolved oxygen, if we have some initial value where this is dissolved oxygen at saturation in the river, given some temperature, and then with the addition of waste, you know, maybe the river normally has a little bit of a deficit here. because there's biological processes happening and it's, that's pretty typical. It's not pristine, perfect, pure water. In fact, any biological life should have some impact of um, reducing the oxygen 
available there, so we, we kind of expect something. Um, so let's say we have some initial deficit, but then we discharge wastewater um, at time or distance zero here. So we can, we can kind of think in a river or a stream, it's going to flow kind of like a plug flow reactor, right? It's going to be traveling downstream, and maybe there's a bend in the stream, but the, the flow is just heading down at some, at some rate, and we can just consider the distance basically equal to the time. So we can use this plot here, distance or time downstream, <clears throat> and then consider what happens to this dissolved oxygen when we add waste. Well, it's going to begin to decrease the amount of oxygen. And typically what will happen is it'll, uh, it'll kind of look something like this, where it's a bit of a curved shape, and then eventually it comes back to kind of where it was, closer, close to the saturation again. So when this happens, we can eventually calculate, all right, at some point maybe we have the minimum value. Uh, and so if we were to consider this point, we could say that's our dissolved oxygen minimum. That's going to be the most crucial point for our fish and wildlife in terms of what effect we're having, our wastewater discharge is having on the habitat, thinking about BOD uh, just by itself. You know, there are other components. If we discharge a bunch of chlorine because we chlorinated to disinfect, the chlorine can kill organisms. It's essentially toxic in that way in too much. So there's plenty of ways that wastewater can affect the habitat or the the natural wildlife and things, but on a dissolved oxygen basis, kind of, again, one of the um, principal concerns here, um, this is all we're going to look at is the dissolved oxygen. So this will be, um, this here, we can call the critical point, the time or distance at which this crosses, this happens, um, We'll define that as our critical point, and we can call that x critical, c. So our x value, our, our critical x value there is, um, is what we're referring to. At any given point along this way, we could measure and say our current deficit is the difference between our saturation value and our current dissolved oxygen value. So again, this is a DO curve. What we're measuring here is dissolved oxygen. And this would be our D for deficit. At some time or distance. So I'll just say deficit at x, for example, here. OK, so that's kind of going to be our, our system that we're analyzing here. So we want to model what's happening. And you'll notice a few things are happening, right? We have dissolved oxygen decreasing, but then something's lifting it back up. So in, a, in an actual river or stream flowing, flowing through here, we're going to have oxygen from the atmosphere mixing back in with the water. And so we've got a couple of competing uh, forces, so to speak, uh, two different competing reactions that are adding or removing oxygen from our system. It's going to be bacteria and organisms doing respiration, taking oxygen from the water, and then we're going to have re-aeration and the gas laws that dictate how much oxygen partitions from the atmosphere into the water and dissolve that way. Um, that's going to be the other competing force or competing uh, reaction here. And what we're going to say is that competing um, term, we're going to have some generalization that we can use to estimate it based on the characteristics of the river. All right. So there's another way we can consider what's happening. And by the way, we're going to keep this pretty much to streams and rivers. That means we can 
kind of look at them like a plug flow reactor, sort of how we drew over here. They're, we're going to be um, monitoring what happens to this wastewater that is being sent downriver. Okay? Uh, it's mixing, and then that plug of, that's a mixture of wastewater and river water, and that's kind of flowing down, down river. And we can track what's happening with that plug and treat it um, in a plug flow reactor type of way. It's a, a, it's a good question. Do we consider input from other streams or rivers to reoxygenate? It's certainly possible, um, and you, you could certainly do that. What we're going to look at with our class is just a simple case. We're not adding any other influence, but you would have to, if you're doing a biological survey or whatever for a, a river, you would actually need to um, account for other, other streams mixing. Um, and so then you might have a bump up with, when you suddenly dilute with a nice pristine stream or well aerated, um, maybe a waterfall enters the river or something and creates a lot of aeration, you would actually have to account for that type of thing to get a, a more accurate model. So likewise, if you have multiple discharges, maybe you have another wastewater dump right here, that would be uh, introduce another um, forcing downwards for the uh, dissolved oxygen. So. Both of those can, can certainly happen, and in real life, you know, in real systems, you would need to deal with that. And in fact, um, those are dealt with uh, by these types of models to understand, okay, this wastewater plant can discharge, but that means the wastewater plant one mile downstream may not be able to discharge as much. So there's some um, back and forth in the permitting process about who can, who can discharge what and how to make that fair between them especially when you've got an urban area with lots of people wanting to discharge it. Becomes very important. Okay, so there's another way we can, another tool we can use. It actually relates back to our, our topic at the beginning of class here. Um, to estimate what's going on in the rivers, we can use what's called total organic carbon. Uh, we have a TOC analyzer upstairs in the, uh, one of the environmental labs. Essentially, this is it one version of carbonaceous oxygen demand measurement. Um, it's essentially oxidizes whatever's in the water and measures how much CO2 comes off because of that oxidation. So we convert all the carbon into CO2. So we go organic carbon. We blast it with very oxidizing conditions. We convert basically everything possible, everything we can, into CO2. And we measure how much CO2 is coming off. So obviously we have to purge it of CO2 from the atmosphere or any dissolved CO2 in the water, which is carbonate. We do that sort of stuff. This instrument does all that. And then it measures the CO2. And this gives us a, a decent estimation of how much organic carbon is in there. There's going to be other sources. There's going to be natural organic matter, stuff like that. So there's always going to be some TOC, but essentially what we could look at in the same thing if we discharged pollution here, then we could watch as the amount of TOC, the amount of total organic carbon, decreases over time as it's being oxidized by bacterial um, action. And we could also look at kind of the inverse and say, okay, well, how much um, oxidized carbon um, is released? And really, this would probably be CO2 um, if you were to measure that. So that's one way we can also take a look at it um, in terms of what's happening with the carbon as we go down the stream. And that makes it a little simpler than this curve that goes down then back up because, you know, that's dealing with the oxygen with both consumption and production or um, re aeration, whereas this guy is just looking at what's happening to that carbon. Okay, so that's kind of gives you a picture. And by the way, this uh, TOC measurement just takes um, a matter of 30 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. 
it's relatively quick compared to the five days it takes to measure um, the BOD5. All right, so considering this uh, BOD sag curve, I think I've accidentally repeated this slide. Um, yeah. Okay, so we talked about this BOD sag curve. It's another term for uh, what happens here as the um, oxygen is pulled down by the biological processes. I merged two, um, two PowerPoints this morning for today, and that was picking up where we stopped. Um, you know, that was the previous lecture break. I wanted to go a little further today, give more time for the exam re uh, recap to, uh, next time. Okay, so in order to understand what's going on with this system, we want to know how quickly the BOD is being removed uh, and the oxygen itself. Um, so we're going to deal with the BOD removal. So removing BOD is meaning we're actively demanding that oxygen. So in order to work with this, we need to look at the amount of BOD remaining. So we start with some amount of BOD. At some time later, we have BOD, um, we have some amount of it remaining. So LT is going to be the BOD remaining at time T. We can contrast that with what we call the ultimate BOD, L0, the BOD remaining at time zero. Um, now, these are going to be infinite. Um, infinite in terms of the amount of time, like these, these are sort of theoretical measurements, right? We've got um, the ultimate BOD, if we gave it um, an infinite amount of time to consume this BOD, this is the amount we would measure. So. BOD5 is still useful here and we can use it, but we just want to keep in mind that when we're talking about the ultimate BOD, um, that's the ultimate that can ever be consumed in the system. Even if we measure 10 days downstream, uh, we can still measure some BOD and we can do that with a BOD5 test, um, even though some has already been removed. So um, we measure the BOD at some time T, that's LT. We measure the BOD Initially, that's L0, that is in the river mixed um, with the wastewater in our river case. Okay, so then what we want to do is track how this BOD is changing in the system, in the river. We're going to say DLT, DT is equal to some decay. We're decaying this BOD that's remaining. We're going to say that's minus KLT. We've seen this before. We're treating it like a plug flow reactor. So we've got the batch kinetics where we're substituting T for uh, theta or just the amount of time downstream um, it's gone. <coughs> so LT equals L0 times E to the minus KT. K is our BOD reaction rate constant in per time units. So it's a first order decay reaction of the amount of BOD in solution. Okay, yeah, and here I, I say the L, L0 is from the BOD in the river plus the wastewater. So L0 here, um, we can define that as LT, the amount remaining, plus the BOD that has been consumed up to that point. All right, so with that, we can balance that rate at which LT, so the BOD remaining in the water, is removed, and balance that against the reaeration constant. Okay, so when we want to know how much oxygen is remaining somewhere, we need to know how much of the oxygen demanding stuff is left there. And we need to know at what rate um, that's corresponding to deoxygenation and at what rate the river is reoxygenating. Okay, so we're going to end up with um, this deoxygenation based on how much is remaining, this LT, 
and we're going to give that in the form of this rate of deoxygenation. Just by looking at this equation here, we have some constant here, Kd, and we have this initial amount of L of uh, BOD remaining times e to the minus Kd t. So we see here it's something like a first order reaction. It's involving the amount of um, amount of BOD that we started with. And we've got this new constant, Kd. This is going to be our deoxygenation rate constant. There's a couple things here with the, this deoxygenation. It's going to be, um, or excuse me, the reaeration we'll get to. So we have this equation. This is essentially mixing or converting what we just talked about with the, um, the rate at which the BOD remaining is changing um, and quantifying it as a total rate of deoxygenation. Okay. For reaeration, reaeration is going to be a physical process. Oxygen is entering back into the river uh, or water. It's going to be proportional to the oxygen that's missing. So a lot of systems like this are driven by gradients. If we have zero oxygen in the water and it's exposed to the atmosphere, there's going to be a strong gradient pushing oxygen into the water. So that oxygen deficit, which we've termed D, and I do apologize, all these D, DO, uh, all of that, um, it's kind of a lot. So make sure you're clear on which D is which. So this oxygen deficit um, is going to be essentially that quantity that we're on a first order basis with. So the reaeration rate then is Kr times that deficit. So Kr is this reaeration rate constant and per time, so this is first order. And we can define the deficit as the DO at saturation, we talked about this already, minus the current, so DO at time t. All right, so I'm going to wrap up with this last thought here. This Kr, we can know something about how quickly this reaeration is happening, oh, sorry, um, based on aspects of the river. So again, we're just assuming a river here. We have this equation here, Kr, and I'm, I gave you this on your formula sheet. Kr is 3.9 times u to the 1 half power divided by h to the 3 halves power. u is the speed of the river in meters per second and h is the depth of the river in meters. This is an empirical formula people have estimated and observed based on um, just lots of uh, field experiments. So this holds true for a fair number of rivers. It's pretty useful. It's not going to be exact for every river. There's going to be other processes involved. Uh, temperature will probably be important. Certainly this, we see that the, uh, the deficit would affect the temperature um, as well. I'm guessing if you had a lot of wind action on the surface, that would certainly change things. But this is a good estimation here, um, a tool to, if we have information about the river, we can estimate the rate at which oxygen is being, or the, the constant, the rate constant for for that rate of reoxygenation can be estimated by this um, fraction here. So we just need this, the speed and the height. Um, nothing else matters too much. Got a question? So that formula, well, I'm guessing that a constant converts it from per second to per meter. So the, this, um, this constant here, this is going to be, so that's a great question, is, does it convert to uh, from seconds to days? This, we have, um, seconds here, so meters per second to the one half power. So this should this will end up in seconds if you if you use it. I will double check for you, but I think I just wrote this initially. Put it in here initially just as an example. This is a per time. Um, so I will say 
let's take a look at the problem and make sure these match. Okay, so let's um, convert those as needed. Great question. Okay, so I'll try to have that corrected for you next time. Um, I will have your exams for you next time, and I'll have the homeworks with those uh, if you're here. So I will see you on Thursday. We'll pick up here.